Greg Penn becomes the 16th commitment for the LSU Tigers. We got to talk about it after the bumper. Don't be cornering me. Hold up. Time. You got to help me with that, that corner sh**. <laughs> What's up, kinfolk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. It's always college football related. Sports related, we have a good time. Today, I want to talk about Greg Penn, who announced his commitment to LSU this Sunday making him the 16th commit to the class and solidifying a top five ranking in July for Ed Orgeron's LSU Tigers. Now, with some rankings movement, he leaves the five-star, but Rajon Davis still leads the class and is a top 40 player. But more than that, this is the fourth commitment for LSU in the last two weeks. Chris Hilton, Keanu Coat, and Naquan Brown all in the last two weeks. On top of that, they have been getting really deep at linebacker and edge, Okay. Now, there's reason for that, because Jabril Cox is, like, the only senior that they're going to have, and he's going to, I mean, he's going to depart, but you're going to lose him, grad transfer from North Dakota State, and you're probably going to lose Damon Clark if he has a great year. Behind them is Micah Bakersfield, and then there's also Antoine Sopa, uh, Sampa, excuse me, and Josh White, so they need the depth, especially since they're moving to this 4-3 defense where Bo Pelini's going to do some moving and some shaking and some looking around at what he has and what he doesn't have. And also losing Marcel Brooks to the transfer portal. Wants to play safety. Perhaps it's Baylor. Perhaps it's Texas. Perhaps it's Oklahoma. We'll all have to wait and see. And we're still waiting to see what happens in regard to so many of their talented underclassmen. So, like, Derek Stingley Jr. is insured for one more year at LSU. Whether or not he plays safety or some sort of hybrid nickel, or they tried to build the defense around him in the coming years, we'll have to see, right? But I think this is particularly interesting because Ed Orgeron is giving LSU the tools to do what LSU fans believe they're going to do this year, which is reload and not rebuild. And you do that by consistently having top five, top ten classes. Now, Greg Penn is listed as an inside linebacker, and that's big because you're talking about Naquan Brown, who could go edge, but definitely outside linebacker, and perhaps Rajon Davis could also go outside linebacker or inside, and Xavier Carter could go inside or outside, but Greg Penn is a natural 225, 230-pound kind of inside linebacker, the guy that can play your mic or your will and give you some flexibility over there and also be the guy that can be the captain in the middle of your defense, a la Patrick Queen last year, or even Jacob Phillips just kind of chase and tackle, right? Not unlike Kenneth Murray Jr. who went in the first round for Oklahoma last year. He also comes, and this is big, out of DeMatha Catholic, which is in Maryland, because his top four included LSU, South Carolina, Maryland, and Alabama. Beating out Maryland is not really the thing that Maryland fans think it is. That said, Mike Loxley has been doing a really great job of putting a rope up around the state of Maryland and keeping that talent, for the most part, in. Now, he's lost the really high-value targets, like Caleb Williams to Oklahoma, and yes, of course, we're talking about Greg Penn leaving Maryland to go to LSU, but it speaks volumes that these kids continue to put Maryland in their top four. It means that Maryland is continuing to trend in the direction that they should be, which is upward and they could finish with a better recruiting class than Michigan if Michigan's not careful because Jim Harbaugh continues to lose kids that he should probably win in and around his area. I like that Greg Penn comes out of DeMatha because for those of you that follow the commentary here about Caleb Williams, you'll know that DeMatha is a direct rival of Gonzaga. A couple years ago, they're both in the Washington Catholic Athletic Conference title game, which ended in a Hail Mary that Caleb Williams threw and completed to win them the title in 2018. But more than that, DeMatha continues to put out top talent to top talent after top talent. And going into Maryland to get a win as LSU is remarkable and also kind of some get back because you'll remember Rakeem Jarrett surprised the world when he decided to sign, commit and sign to Maryland when we all thought that he was an LSU lean all the way, five-star wide receiver. And now he's going to follow in the footsteps of Darius Hayward Bay, Stefan Diggs, and others, because we don't talk about it enough, but Maryland can put out some wide receivers. Meanwhile, LSU just puts out defensive talent. That's, that's what they do. Whether it be defensive back, linebacker, or defensive line, you can look at Glenn Dorsey. You can look at Patrick Queen and or Jacob Phillips. You can look at Pat Peterson, Taryn Matthew, and on it goes, right? And I think that this class is really well put together. You got Garrett Nussmeyer as your quarterback in your future quarterback, right? You have JoJo Earl, who's a top wide receiver in this class and can be 
what Jamar Chase is for them today, what Terrace Marshall is for them today, what Justin Jefferson was for them last year. You also get to add dudes like Corey Klein coming out of Ohio, who I think was good enough to play at Ohio State, just decided to go to LSU. You're also competing nationally with recruits and going into Texas and winning guys that have Texas at the top of their list. I mean, it should say something that you go into Flower Mound and you get Garrett Nussmeyer, and while you didn't really make a play for J. Michael Sturdivant, he ends up leaving the area to go to Cal or commit to Cal. So you're not really losing even when you lose. Whereas we're looking at Tristan Lee, who also seems to be having fun talking up LSU and Ohio State. And that should tell you a lot because Clemson had him high on their list. And that's what I would like to see LSU do next, right? You already got Garrett Dellinger in as offensive tackle. You need to get another one in. Losing J.C. Latham to Alabama is a double whammy because if he just commits to Ohio State, you lose, but you don't lose twice. With Alabama winning his commitment, you lose twice because now you got to play against that guy in your division. And that's what Ed Orgeron is competing against and what he's going to be recruiting against for the foreseeable future, right? And what LSU has been able to do, like many other schools, quite honestly, in this pandemic cannot be overlooked because recruiting has remained recruiting. The guys that are really good at being on the phone, the guys that are really good at talking to the kids about what LSU or what Ohio State or what North Carolina can do for them and vice versa are winning the recruits. And we're hearing this story become just regular of guys not visiting before they decide to make an announcement and commit. Now, some of this is a numbers game. The kids are being told, look, the spot is yours, but it ain't yours forever. Okay, so if you want it, you need to come and get it. And Clemson does a little bit of this and their policy of not letting guys take visits to other places. I understand, and it also works for them, but I think it's a little bit shady. Meanwhile, Ed Orgeron just decides, like Ryan Day decides, we're the best. We know that we're good, and we know that you're good, and we're going to continue to recruit you with that in mind. And Ed Orgeron continues to recruit even after he's done recruiting. I've told this story, but I will tell this story again. I knew what Ed Orgeron meant to college football and what he meant to LSU by how he reacted to winning the game against Auburn, which you could make an argument was the closest game that they played all year, even as they put up 500 yards of offense. He goes and makes a point of seeing Big Cat Bryant and Derrick Brown and telling them what kind of a fantastic game they played and how proud of them he was to watch them play. And he said, look, I told you both when I recruited you, first round draft pick, first round draft pick. So far, Derrick Brown has proved him half right, and we'll see what uh, with Big Cat Bryant. But how do you not want to play for that man? How do you not want to play for a guy who remembers recruiting you and is so mad that you got away? He did this with CeeDee Lamb. When Oklahoma was playing LSU in the Peach Bowl, he made a point of talking about, look, CeeDee Lamb is outstanding. I don't know how I let him go. He comes out of Oopaloosa in Louisiana. I know that there's the Texas thing, and he kind of grew up there, but I felt like we had a real shot to go get him, and I'm mad that we get him even as he put together one of the great college football seasons of all time and had a Bolitnikoff Award winner at wide receiver, had a first-round draft pick at wide receiver, and we'll see what ends up happening with uh, with Terrace Marshall and Jamar Chase. But, like, then you look at Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Then you look at Joe Burrow. And then you look at that Joe Moore Award-winning offensive line. Ed Orgeron comes from the place of, you know, like, like, not Stifler, but I forget this dude's name. Now I'm screwing up the story. But it's... The guy who gets with Stifler's mom who says that all the women are for me. It's a very crass statement. It's also real edgy, but that's how you have to look at recruiting. You have to look at recruiting. There's nobody's off limits. I need to be able to go and get whomever is out there. And that's how Ed Orgeron has been able to do this, and that's one way for him to go and get a guy like Greg Penn, who I think is going to be a natural slot for them at Mike and Will. I'm excited to see what happens with this class. All right, that's it for me. Doses.